How did you become interested in aviation? Well, I suppose really it goes back to my father, who was a Battle of Britain pilot, in fact, flew hurricanes in the Battle of Britain and throughout the war, mainly. And I grew up in South Africa, um, and sort of the yearning to sort of go flying sort of grew sort of steadily on me as I got older. And then I actually joined the RAF uh, in South Africa, and Her Majesty's Government shipped me across, and uh, I'm still here. So that's how, really how I came into, into the RAF. What was your first flying experience? You know, my first flying experience, other than, was flying with my father in South Africa um, in a little light aircraft. We didn't have uh, air cadets and things like that then, so I didn't have the opportunity to go flying, flying as an air cadet. So I had very limited uh, flying experience before I came across here. I'd obviously gone through aptitude tests and various other sort of tests in South Africa to see if I was, I was um, going to be sort of a, a, a trainable chap which obviously they thought I was. <laughs> what year did you join the RAF and how did, you, uh, how did this come about? Um, I joined the RAF in 1965 um, and came about from South Africa. I did my uh, medical test with the South African Air Force. I did my aptitude tests with the university in Johannesburg. And uh, in those days, there was a British defence liaison staff in Pretoria did my interviews with them and I remember coming through, they had a lovely place in Pretoria and I was sitting there, they came through and said, um, congratulations, we've accepted you for pilot training. When would you like to sail? Um, which I thought that was good. Uh, what would you like to drink? So I thought this all was well for the future. <laughs> did you have a type of role when you joined you wanted? Yes, uh, to be quite frank, I had set my sights on flying the Lightning. Um, I had seen uh, a advertising brochure in South Africa that said join the Royal Air Force and the world is your oyster and on the front cover was a squadron of lightnings it was number 74 squadron in fact and the pilots walking back from uh, um, their, their sortie and I looked at that and I said that's me so I single-mindedly sort of said set my set my heart on becoming a lightning pilot and you know you had to I, I had to work exceedingly hard in training because you don't get anything for nothing um, but um, I obviously took to the air sort of uh, in a good way and I got what I wanted. How long was your training after you were accepted? Uh, I've, two weeks on board ship, uh, Union Castle from uh, Cape Town to Southampton. I only mentioned that because that was good training as well. <laughs> um, and then I did my, went into my officer training. I was too old to go to Cranwell because I'd been at university in Johannesburg. And um, I did my officer training at South Cerny in uh, um, near uh, Sirencester, and then I went off into flying training. Did my basic flying training at Acklington in Northumberland, that was for a year. Then I moved on to RAF Valley to do my advanced flying training on the NAT, um, six months there. Then I went off to Chivener in Devon to fly the Hunter and to do my sort of pre-lightning, sort of tactical weapons training there. So that was that two years by now. Then I went off to the Lightning, do a six month course at uh, RF Coldershaw. And then I went off to my first operational tour, which was in Germany. So I think in all, you know, it, it was between two and a half and three years of training. Absolutely fantastic. I did seven years flying the Lightning, 1500 hours, and my, I enjoyed my last trip flying the Lightning as much as I did my first trip. It was, uh, I remember going to uh, see the Lightning for the first time, and when you see it, you think, wow, it's a big aircraft. And it's a, after you've flown the Jet Provost, the Nat, and the Hunter, the Lightning's a big aircraft, weighed 20 tonnes. And it was just a beautiful aircraft to fly. Every takeoff was a kick in the backside. Um, and it was just, it was, it was a single seater. It was just a pure dream to fly, absolutely loved it. Was it a difficult jet to fly? No, it, um, I would say that the aircraft, actual flying the aircraft was not difficult. What people did find difficult was keeping up with the speed of the aircraft. And that's where people sort of really, because if you get behind the aircraft, then you've got problems from the start. So you've got to, you've got to be quick thinking, fast, fast reacting. And uh, I didn't have a problem there at all. So I, again, I, I just clicked with the lightning. It, uh, it, it's like putting a glove on to me. What was it like the first time you strapped into one? 
I thought this is this is my dream. I had uh, I have to say also that I had a very good instructor at uh, Coldershaw, who became a very personal friend too, um, and. I just, I, I had got to where I wanted to be and I wasn't going to fail at that point. People did fail, but uh, you know, again, hard work and uh, application um, goes a long way to sort of uh, uh, achieving success. How long did you fly it? Seven years. Can you tell us some of the squadrons you were with? Yeah, I went to Germany first of all on to 92 squadron, that was my first squadron. And one first squadron is always one's most cherished squadron. Um, it was a very famous squadron, uh, very proud history. And Germany was, uh, where I went to was Goodersloe, which was the, for the, in those days, because we were really in Cold War days now, it was the closest RAF base to the uh, Eastern Bloc, shall we say, to the, to the enemy in those days. And life was very real in the Cold War. And it was, uh, it had its, Germany was very, very challenging as well, particularly in winter. You had a lot of bad weather to deal with in Germany. Um, you were close to the border, so you had to know where you are, actually flying the lightning. I mean, you always had to be, if, if any aircraft is good at teaching you airmanship, it's the lightning, because in those days, certainly the early lightnings, um, were very short range and as everybody knows about the lightning fuel was very critical uh, most of the time particularly on the short range lightning so you moved around the sky pretty fast you climbed at 450 knots converting to 0.9 so you just you, you could go supersonic in the climb and you, you cruised around at high level at uh, just below the, the uh, sp speed of sound so you're moving fast your fuel's going down fast you've got to know where you are and you've got to get that aircraft back on the ground sort of uh, before it runs out of fuel Overall, did you enjoy flying it? Uh, I enjoyed everything. I mean, I was in the air defense role, obviously. Um, and the air defense, I flew, flew lightnings both in, in Germany and then back at Coldershaw. And at Coldershaw, I was on the instructional staff then, um, one of the youngest, in fact, on the instructional staff. But also we had, a, we had a, um, an operational squadron role as well. And the role between flying lightnings in Germany and flying lightnings in the UK was very different. In Germany, we were facing the border and, and we were facing MiG-21s um, on the other side. There was a lot of reaction, a lot of scrambles. We had two aircraft at five minutes readiness, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. And we used to get scrambled a lot and getting airborne at night in under five minutes from sort of supposedly sleeping um, you know we did it every time we were well trained um, we had to react very quickly in Germany back in the UK we normally got a bit more notice and, and we were facing most of our threat um, was coming from up north in the we had a huge United Kingdom air defense region to police and in this case we, we were mainly up against um, Russian bombers, bears and badgers and things, who we'd get early warning coming around the North Cape of Norway. And we worked very closely with the Norwegians and the Americans. And uh, so there's more time, different, different, different threat, different role, but uh, all of it very real. And in Germany, particularly as we evolved, we got very, very into the, into the low level role uh, out in Germany as well, because um, the, 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 the horde of uh, aircraft coming across to attack us wasn't going to come mainly at high level. It's going to probably come at low level to start with, and that's where we trade. You then moved on to the F4. What was this like? I enjoyed the F4. I mean, I, I went, um, I'd, having done my first two tours on the Lightning, I, I then actually went uh, and did a tour instructing on the Nat um, and the Hunter at uh, RAF Valley where I became Deputy Chief Instructor. I enjoyed that, enjoyed flying the NAT. Then I went onto the Phantom. This is the first time, so I've been flying mainly single-seater aircraft for 10 years. The big difference between uh, now going to the Phantom was I go into an environment with um, a crew of two. Um, the Phantom was, I, I thoroughly enjoyed flying the Phantom, great aircraft, a real war machine. It had, uh, I have to say that it wasn't to me as pleasant to fly as the Lightning. It had one or two characteristics which were quite interesting. Um, but um, as a war machine, it far exceeded the capabilities of the Lightning. It could carry many more missiles. It had much more capability in the avionics sense. And a crew of two um, working effectively was a really efficient crew. Just going back to my Germany days, my first uh, you know, young operational pilot, um, I mentioned that sort of we, we had two aircraft at five minutes readiness, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, we were all weather fighter. 
We used to get scrambled a lot, day and night. Um, sometimes it would be practice scrambles, sometimes it would be um, middle of the night you get scrambled because even the other side used to regularly test us. They'd launch their MiG-21s at the border. Uh, you didn't know where they were going to come across and attack us, so you get scrambled against them. Most of the time they were just sort of testing our reaction time and they'd actually sort of fly at the border, they'd sort of nip across the border. By the time we got up there they were back in the other side, so we'd end up sort of just going up and down the border together. Um, most of the time, we, most of our scrambles though in Germany were, believe it or not, for light aircraft like you see around here. People getting lost and straying towards the border onto the other side. And a lightning um, intercepting a light aircraft which has got a maximum speed of about 130 knots is quite an interesting little exercise because the lightning didn't, didn't go much slower than about 180 knots. But believe me, sort of, I'm sure these light aircraft, when they saw a, a, an aircraft the size of the lightning up alongside it, would get the message pretty, and they did, pretty sort of, uh, pretty clearly. I will mention one thing, you know, we used to police the corridors. We used to, we had a job of policing the corridors uh, to go, that used to lead to Berlin. And these are corridors that aircraft went down to access Berlin. And I remember one case in 1968 when the Russians invaded Czechoslovakia, in fact, and the Russians closed the corridors. This put us into a period of tension. We upped the number of aircraft we had uh, ready to, um, on battle flight, um, operationally ready, and we were going to send a probe down the corridor with fighter escort. That would have been very interesting, and it could have been very exciting. It could have been the start of World War III, for all I know. But uh, fortunately, I have to say now, sort of uh, the politicians uh, prevailed, and they sorted out the problem. Corridors got reopened, and we didn't have to do that. But that's just a little example. I mean, when I say that the, th the threat was very real, the Cold War was a very real situation. The threat was very real um, to us in Germany. And that's just a little example of uh, how real it was. How did you move on to the tornado? Well, I'll be quite honest. I'd had my, I knew the tornado was coming into service and I'd had my eyes on it for some time. And I'd always said, because I looked at the timing and I could see it was roughly going to work. And I said, I really want to be on the tornado when it first comes into service. And I had gone on to my, I made people aware of that as well. I went off, after I'd done my phantom tour, I went to London into a job in the Ministry of Defence and then I went to Staff College. And I, and I got promoted at the end of Staff College and given the job of uh, going and introducing the Tornado F2, as it was in those days, into service and commanding the first, the operational conversion unit. So that was end of 1983 when I went to the Tornado, but that wasn't, it was coming in a year later. So actually I went back and during the next year I flew the Hawk and the Phantom. And then I was, the, the first two Tornadoes got delivered to the RAF on the 5th of November 1984. And I was in one uh, of them with a test pilot from British Airspace and Air Vice Marshal Ken Hare, who was my Air Officer Commanding, was in the other one with another test pilot from British Airspace. That was November 84. Then in the beginning of 85, I took my team, my initial team, uh, and I pre-selected all my team, in fact, for this. Uh, we went off to Wharton, British Airspace there, because there was nobody to convert us to the aircraft, so they converted us at uh, Wharton. We had uh, uh, quite a few months there. And then I flew the third aircraft back to Coningsby at the end of my training at Wharton at the end of March, 9, 31st of March, I think it was, 1985. Um, and then that started the whole introduction of the um, tornado into the OCU and the, the build-up. And we built up over the next few years. Uh, that was uh, March 85. Um, and we were declared operational on the 31st of December, 1986. Now that was quite a fast build-up. I can go into much more detail there. What was the F2 like to fly? The F2 was a delight to fly. It was, uh, I, I, the F2 is, is basically an easy aircraft to fly. It is a beautiful aircraft to fly. It's got beautifully harmonized in every way, in fact. The cockpit environment was the best cockpit environment I've ever experienced. Quiet, nice cockpit, instruments well laid out. 
it, it was it was just a lovely aircraft to fly. It had many sort of new features that I hadn't experienced before. Uh, things like uh, the wing sweep, things like uh, we had uh, spills, spin prevention and instance limiting system. Uh, we had the TVs in the in the cockpits. We had uh, it, it was it was a lovely environment and it was genuinely sort of a, a pleasure to fly it. it. The tornado itself did have limitations it was and that was the engines really as far as I was concerned because we were a fighter that had been uh, sort of developed from the the bomber version the GR1 in those days which was designed very much for low level so the engines were beautiful down in the lower levels but uh, when we get them up into the medium and higher levels they didn't work so well until we got supersonic up tight again. Did it take a lot of training to convert from your previous types? No, in fact I had uh, my total training at uh, with British Airspace was 15 sorties and then sort of we went, we had had a course design team in uh, in situ before that sort of developing how we were going to train and things like that. We were all very experienced air defence pilots and navigators or weapon system operators as they were becoming known as and uh, so we, we because we were so experienced we had the job of developing the training program getting ourselves converted ready to instruct and also getting ourselves operational. Um, no, I'd say, to be quite frank, everything went very smoothly. I say everything went very smoothly. Um, that's not quite true, in fact, because whilst the build-up, the aircraft was a delight to fly, the build-up, the aircraft came in on time, and then we started converting, we, once we'd received the F2s, then we started reconverting onto the F3s. Uh, we had a very sort of... Uh, um, tight build up to our operational declaration. We had to sort of have them to have proved our, our missile firing capability, proved our gun firing capability, proved our capability in all areas and that we were ready to be declared operational to NATO, which did happen, but it didn't just happen uh, because we did have in those early days a lot of problems with the radar. Uh, as I think you're probably aware, um, including at one stage, it's well known that we were known as the Blue Circle Fighter because we had supposedly had cement in the nose of the aircraft. We did have concrete in, I think it was about five aircraft. And the reason we had concrete there was we had the radars, but because the radar was so deficient, they had to take radars out and send them back to GEC to be upgraded. Um, it still didn't fix the problem and then we had a big trial, in fact I took a team down to present to the Commander-in-Chief of uh, Strike Command and to tell him what was going wrong, what was wrong with the radar. He listened and we got given some money, we carried out a trial and it was the, the, that trial and the introduction of fixes to the radar that enabled us to be declared on time. By the time it went out, which always happens with uh, RAF aircraft, this aircraft, the F2, F3, F3, was an exceedingly capable aircraft, it really was, with uh, ASRAM, ASRAM, uh, JTITS, um, a radar that was really working well. It was, uh, it was a really good fighter. What were its best and worst traits? Uh, best traits were the. It had many. It had many many good traits. The the aircraft itself, its flying characteristics, the comfort of environment of the cockpit, ultimately its capability, um, and it was a real. It was a team player, as it were, particularly sort of uh, with the data link capability. Um, the worst traits. To me, the worst trait was uh, um, an, an underperforming engine at the higher levels. What was the F2 cockpit like compared to your previous types? Quantum leap forward. Quantum leap forward. Why was that? Because, as I've said, because of the comfortable environment, because um, we were working in a sort of TV in the back seat. They had uh, two TV tabs, as we call them. In the front seat, we had one TV tab that we could we could cycle between to see what was going on in the back. And you get a lot of information from that. I mean, we could, the radar itself, it had track wire scans, so we could track a number of targets. Um, we had uh, hands-on uh, throttle and uh, uh, stick HOTAS. That made, made a big difference. We had, we had a, a sort of tactical navigation display uh, because, um, you know, we'd moved out of the inertial navigation sort of uh, uh, 
systems that we had in the Phantom onto sort of the computers now sort of uh, that were actually sort of so accurate and we could sort of plot we could we could input so many different things that would help us sort of build up a sort of tactical uh, picture of what was going on out there out in the uh, in the in the environment um, and that even more so with the data link that could be fed to us from all sorts of other platforms as well so from the situ situational awareness point of view quantum leap forward how long was the f2 in service for the f2 well as i said it came into service november 84 we took delivery the first f3 which i flew in service um, was on the i think it was the beginning of august 1986 and that's when the f2 started going out so i reckon the f2 total f2 service it was not it was just over two years Well, having uh, had delivery of uh, the first 17 F F2s, I think it was, because the 18th one went to Boscombe Down, and actually the 18th one was the last one that's only just rec in recent years been retired from Boscombe Down. Then the F3 came along, and it was the F3 that we got declared to NATO with at the end of uh, 86. Um, we had, um, it, it started arriving in July 1986 basically and then sort of we got delivery of uh, a fairly rapid build-up of uh, f3s after that point um, the conversion to the f3 wasn't much of a conversion quite frankly because the two aircraft um, were very similar there were differences um, the f3 had a longer um, bigger jet pipe so it extended the the length of the aircraft by a couple of inches the biggest difference was the fact we went from a 64 kb computer to a um, 128 kb computer um, and that obviously gave us uh, in increased capability. Apart from that, you could climb into an F3 or an F2 and they feel like the same aircraft, really. Was the F3 a good interceptor? Uh, yes, it was a very good interceptor and ultimately it was a very, very good interceptor. Uh, but it improved um, in tandem with the radar improvements got, that got introduced. But it was, it was a good interceptor. That's what it designed as, actually. Could you tell us some of the weapons it carried? Yes. When, uh, when I introduced the, the aircraft, we had uh, um, Sidewinders and um, Skyflash um, missiles. Um, they got replaced over the years by ASRAM and AMRAM, which is what it went out of service with. Um, and on top of that, we had a gun as well, a 27 millimeter Ehrlichan gun, very accurate gun. I'll give you an example of that. I mentioned earlier on, we had to prove ourselves gun firing and uh, um, missile firing before we could be declared operational. So we went off, took the, took the squadron off down to Cyprus uh, to do our armor practice camp sort of gun firing. And it was so good. Um, we, they had, there was a big trophy that all the fighter squadrons competed for called the Seed Trophy. And we won it at the very first attempt that proves how good it was right from the start. On the missile side, uh, the Sidewinder was, was a proven sort of uh, um, missile, worked very well. I did the first Skyflash firing from an RAF aircraft um, on a low level target through cloud, worked beautifully. Skyflash worked well, but it was the, both the Sidewinder and the Skyflash were not as capable as the ASRAM and AMRAM, which were sort of the next missiles, which really helped give the aircraft such a great capability. Could you tell us about the wing sweep function? Yep, uh, it was good. The aircraft, as you've seen it, the wings work from uh, a 25 uh, uh, degree position, which was the forward position, which you use for landing and slow, slow speed flight, right the way back to 67 degrees wing sweep, which is obviously when you're sort of uh, going like a bullet, whether it's high level or um, low level. Um, it was a lovely facility to have. It really gave the aircraft great capability in so many different areas. Um, we had we were going to have, we had manual wing sweep when the aircraft first came in and the, the, the aircraft was planned to get an auto wing sweep capability. In the whole of my time, in my tour as um, officer commanding of number 65 squadron, 
two to nine operational conversion unit as it was, we stuck with the manual system, uh, the, the automatic system. I then went off to London to sort of look after the tornado from the MOD's point of view. And we got into a lot of negotiations there about the auto wing sweep, um, which never came in. Not in this country anyway, it never came in. And it never came in really because uh, there were always teething problems with it. This is, this is my, there, uh, there were always teething problems with it. And the cost of uh, introducing the auto wing sweep kept on going up and up and up. And it just got to a point, it wasn't worth it quite frankly, because if I'm quite honest, in my view, I never had a problem with manual wing sweep. It worked well. If you did, yes, we did. We missed sort of sweeping the wings sometimes, but my experience was that uh, if you happen to miss uh, the speed at which you were supposed to sweep the wings, you get a little little nibble around your backside, which told you sort of uh, the wings are in the wrong position, and that was a clue to sort of move them to the right position. So it, 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 it worked fine. Dissimilar air combat, yeah. love it. Air combat, sport for kings. Love it, love it. Um, DACM, it's the same as, the, the aircraft um, performed very well, but uh, you know, you, you had to sort of fly your aircraft um, to match the capabilities of the aircraft. Um, but with a weapon system that we, with the weapon system that we had in the tornado, and you could invariably sort of uh, work out your tactics to sort of take on uh, the majority of uh, um, other aircraft in dissimilar air combat. Obviously, if you get into a close combat environment between an aircraft like the Tornado and an F-16, for example, you can't match the F-16. So you learn how to fight. You learn how to uh, fight it. That's just an example. You learn how to fi fight it using the capabilities, your best capabilities. And in that context, i.e., sort of, if you can keep the aircraft at a distance, that's when you're best. Was it a good aircraft in your opinion? Yes. The aircraft, inter inter interestingly, I listened uh, to, uh, I talked earlier on that uh, Ian Black and Dave Bledtill and I were, were presenting to the Friends of Duxford some weeks ago. And I was particularly interested to hear uh, Ian Black sort of saying, because he, like me, has flown lightnings, um, phantoms and tornadoes, and he's flown the Mirage as well. And I listened to him say, which I never thought I'd hear him say, actually, he said the best aircraft in which to go to war was the Tornado F3. And I never thought I'd hear him say that, but I actually totally agree with him. Uh, engines on the Tornado. Uh, well, I've already mentioned um, Rolls-Royce, uh, it, it's a good engine, but it was designed for low level. So it's particularly good at low level. And at low level, this aircraft could uh, hold its own against almost anything, quite frankly. Um, but as you get up to the medium level and into the high level, it tends to run out of puff. So it wasn't a brilliant aircraft as far as engine performance was at uh, the medium to high levels. At high level, once you plugged in the reheats and sort of uh, and then it would start accelerating, once you got yourself supersonic and got the wings back, then it sort of really motored, motored again. But it did have that area. So compared with the Lightning, where the Lightning's engines were sort of really powerful, they were powerful at low level, they were powerful wherever. Uh, it didn't have, you know, after flying the Lightning, you miss not having all that power at all through the height range. Um, what was the first time you went supersonic? First time I went supersonic was actually before I even went onto the Lightning. It was when I was doing my training at, um, on the NAT at RAF Valley. The NAT had a supersonic capability and we used to, we used to go uh, supersonic there to Mach 1.1. Just It was all part of our training into sort of transonic and supersonic flight. Um, and in fact, yeah, the NAT. And I have to say, the NAT was a real sports car of an aircraft. Got over a thousand hours on the NAT. Lovely aircraft to fly as well. Well, it's nice to be uh, looking into uh, an F3 cockpit again, even though it uh, is minus a few things, but uh, certainly brings back lots of memories. As I, If I just look at the, the front first of all, um, obviously sort of up here we've got uh, various, uh, we, we would have our head up display there, which was uh, really important. And that's obviously sort of uh, um, through which we did most of our sort of flying the aircraft. 
down here this is an angle of attack indicator always important g meter um, here this is the tv uh, repeater screen two tvs in the back one tv in the front um, radar homing and warning receiver screen here a missile management system over there all the instruments standard instruments in those days but they all worked pretty well um, down the left hand side we've got throttles the wing sweep uh, um, lever and uh, i recognize the the CSAS, the Control Stability Augmentation System, light system, it had a magnificent control uh, in the aircraft. It had uh, um, a fly-by-wire system with the sort of uh, four backups and CSAS, and it really worked very well. And I remember that, that side there, throttles I've talked about, flaps, um, undercarriage over there. Down this side, this is the main master warning panel, and uh, these are all, I'm not going to go through them in, in all of them just by themselves. Suffice to say, engine instruments, engine controls rather, and a number of avionic controls. But it's all coming back, and that's the, the master control panel down the center. It's got to sort of just pull up the lever, and everything gets switched to on. It was a very nice cockpit in which to work, easy to operate, and once you've found your way around, particularly easy to operate. Very, very comfortable cockpit environment. I loved it in here. The, the HOTAS system is very much designed like, uh, I remember when we were sort of redesigning this and it came in, it's very much similar to the F-18 uh, cockpit. Um, but basically this gives us um, hands-on throttle and stick. So you could sit here, fly the aircraft and operate all the weapon system from, this, from, the, from the stick here with your hand, other hand on the throttles down there. That's what HOTAS is all about, and it was pretty efficient in this aircraft. You know, we talked about wing suite already, but uh, looking at the throttles down there, and um, one, one unique thing that Tornado had were thrust reverses down the back end. So we didn't have a, a tail parachute like the Lightning and the Phantom did. We would uh, slow ourselves down by using thrust reverses like the airliners do. Very efficient system it, 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 uh, it was, although it's a fair old weight penalty down the back end. But if I look at the throttles there, we just used to sort of operate the thrust reverses by rocking the throttles outboard and then moving them forward to sort of uh, increase the power on the thrust reverses. Very simple, very effective system. Well, I went, I went from uh, going back a little bit, sort of a bit from my command at Coningsby to the MOD where I was ran the role office as it was known as and I got promoted and became uh, Deputy Director of Air Defence in London for a short time before I then became Station Commander at RAF Leeming um, which was a, a great privilege and, and honour and, and to go to Leeming which was the one base that had three tornado squadrons was, uh, was very special to me. Um, that ha I went to Leeming in June 84 and I was there for two years, which obviously covered the Gulf War as well. And the Gulf War was interesting because I arrived in June and the Gulf War came up in August. August the 2nd, I think, uh, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And um, on the 8th, we, we were well aware of all that was going on and, and we'd been uh, preparing missiles that were being flown out to the Gulf. Um, and I remember I was in my office on the 8th of uh, um, August, 10 o'clock in, no, yeah, in the morning, it's quarter past 10 actually, and I got a phone call from uh, um, the then Air Vice Marshal Dick Johns, uh, who was Senior Air Staff Officer at uh, Strike Command, and he said, morning Rick. And I said, morning sir. He said, you know what's going on in the, in the Gulf? I said, uh, yes sir. He said, you know we're, we're going to send some two squadrons of fighters down there. I said, yes sir. He said, you know we're looking for somebody to go and command the whole thing down there. And I said, yes sir. He said, well you're the man. Get your backside down here for a briefing by the Commander in Chief this afternoon and you'll be flying out tonight. At that stage I was not just commanding the, uh, going to command the uh, tornadoes down there. I was going to command everything. So I was the, as it turned out, I was the very first commander out into the Gulf in the first Gulf War. Unbeknown to me, that was quarter past ten. I'd actually left. I, I left uh, Leeming at quarter past eleven because there was already an aircraft on its way to pick me up at Leeming. I went home to the residence uh, where my family were, so I was able to say goodbye to them. 
Um, and while I was there, I was sort of getting in combat kit and I was given a gun that was live. And uh, um, the, the doctor, before I pulled my trousers up, was sort of into my thighs and pumping me full of goodness knows what. I haven't, all I'll say is I haven't yet experienced Gulf War syndrome, <laughs> but I don't, to this day, I don't know what I had pumped into me. Um, and that afternoon, I was down at uh, Strike Command, saw the intelligence staffs, um, had my sort of security clearance, which was already top secret, increased to the very highest level, which was also very interesting. And um, then I saw the commander in chief. He came back from uh, being in uh, a cabinet meeting and said, well, Rick, you know, get down to leaning to line them. You'll be flying out with a bunch of Hercules tonight. Brief the fighter boys who were in, uh, already in Cyprus as you go through Cyprus on the way to Dharan, which, which I then knew was where I was going. Um, he, and he said, I don't know, where you, don't know where you're going to stay down there. I don't know what the situation you're going to find. Keep me informed. Um, come back to me as soon as possible um, after you get there. Um, but uh, off now down to um, Lynham sort of and get going. And I thought that was actually, funnily enough, one of the best briefs I'd ever had because it gave me, it didn't tell me, as some people told me in my life, what to do. It gave me sort of a clean sheet of paper to go and use my brain and sort it out. Um, and that was brilliant. And that's exactly what I did. Um, so anyway, things built up rapidly. I went down to Dharan, come on you the whole lot. But by the following week, in fact, it had escalated even further. And then I just became commander of all the facilities, all the resources, which were tornadoes mainly. At Dharan, I worked very closely with my American F-15 counterpart commander and also the Saudi prince who commanded Dharan in those days, Prince Turkey. And then Air, Vi Air Vice Marshal Sandy Wilson sort of came out and took command of the whole thing. That's how it all happened. <laughs> In, I finished uh, my job as station commander at Leeming in June 92, and then I went to Washington, uh, into the British Embassy in Washington, as assistant air attaché and deputy commander of RAF uh, staff. In, in fact, I had command of all the RAF resources uh, in America at the time, which was quite substantial. Um, very interesting job. Um, I travelled America. I had uh, I spent a lot of time in the Pentagon um, because really in the British Embassy we were known as uh, MOD West, you know, just sort of because we worked so closely with the Americans. I should have, I was posted there for three years, but in actual fact I only spent 16 months in America because I got promoted to Air Commodore and brought back to the UK. So on the one hand, I was delighted about the promotion and the job I was going to go into, which was Inspector of Flight Safety for the RAF. But sorry not to spend my full three years in America, A, to sort of uh, um, put a bit of money back into the pot that I'd sort of spent while I was Station Commander Leeming, but also to sort of enjoy fully what I was enjoying greatly um, in, in America. From, 19, from March 1994 to November 97, I was Inspector of Flight Safety for the RAF. Absolutely fantastic job, loved it. And I reported directly to the Chief of the Air Staff. I had a direct line to him, um, but I had a big staff. I was responsible for flight safety throughout the RAF. My deputy sort of ran the headquarters as it were. I spent my time outside flying and, and dealing with the people. And I, I stayed fully current on the Tornado, so continued to fly the Tornado F3 a lot. But I flew, I stayed current on aircraft like the Tucano and the Hawk, and even the, uh, the Hercules. And I flew everything else. And, and in that tour, I had my eyes open wide about other flying activities. I did a helicopter course, flew all the helicopters. I uh, um, flew with the Hercules Special Forces, uh, low level over Wales. I flew the Nimrod, low level, um, off the north of Scotland. I had a fascinating time, very interesting, great job. Well, my RF career wasn't quite over by then because, um, in fact, I, they tried to persuade me to... Uh, I got offered the job of going to Scotland as the Air Officer Commanding of uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland. But my wife had just gone to university. For a variety of reasons, I didn't go there. But I did go into, back into the Ministry of Defence for my last couple of years as Director of Eurofighter, uh, Eurofighter Typhoon. So, really, I was involved with fighters from the start of my career to the end of my career. 
I left the Air Force then um, to go and work for General Dynamics as their Director of Government Relations. I did three years with them, then I um, left them because they were becoming more army orientated and I went to, um, I became Director of Operations for an American company that was uh, involved in a consortium that was bidding for what was known as the UK Military Flying Training System Programme, a multi-billion pound programme. So I went into that consortium as their representative and very quickly found myself as Managing Director. Um, and I had a fantastic four years in, the, in that job before the announcement. Unfortunately, we didn't win the bid, but we're pretty close to it. We had, it was a great experience um, and I wouldn't have changed that at all. After that, I went consulted for a number of companies. I became um, master of a city livery company, the Air Pilots, which was a, a great honor and privilege. And I, I regarded that as um, the pinnacle of a long career in, in aviation. That also took me on a around the world tour, visiting a number of places. Very special job that. And since then, I've continued to sort of consulting. I, these days, I hold a number of chairmanships. I'm, Chairman of the uh, General Aviation Safety Council. I'm president of the Historic Aircraft Association. I'm um, um, chairman of the International Air Cadets Training Organization. Um, chairman of Imperial War Museum Duxford Flying Control Committee. Deeply involved with air displays. I'm also vice chairman of the RAF Club. I've got plenty to do. <laughs> So, do you have any hobbies? Yes. My hobbies are sport, um, stamp collecting, I've got a very dormant hobby of painting, and um, I'm interested in anything to do with finance. Do you ever go to air shows? Yes, I'm deeply involved with air shows. I've been involved really throughout my career. I've uh, been a display pilot on, a, on the Nat, the Lightning, the Tornado, um, I did, for example, in, in just after I'd converted to the tornado, which as I said earlier on was in beginning of 1985, about March 85, the Air Officer Commanding called me and said, um, Rick, it's the 50th anniversary of the, uh, um, the Spitfire. Wouldn't it be great if we had sort of the old with the new, a synchronized display with the Spitfire and the tornado? And I said, I'm all for it. Um, there were only two pilots at this stage converted to the Tornado, me and another chap called Chris Stevens. I was a squadron commander, so I shouldn't have really done it. But shortly after um, that decision that we we're going to do it, the other pilot who converted, cycling home from the bar on a Friday night, fell off his bike and got concussed, and he was all flying for three months. Then there was only one, me. So I did it. So and I had a fantastic year of... Uh, displaying the tornado in a synchronized display together with Spitfire flown by um, Paul Day and uh, a, a great experience. It was a brilliant show that uh, sort of got much acclaim and I loved doing it. However, we just did it that year because at the end of the year because the tornado could fly a lot slower than aircraft like the Lightning and the Phantom and some of the air marshals sort of on the Air Force board looked at this and sort of said, is this safe? But it was very safe in the tornado, you could do it, whereas you couldn't have done it in the Lightning or the Phantom the same way. Uh, so it got stopped. It did got done again um, periodically and of course these days you see the Typhoon and the, and the uh, Spitfire doing it. But I did the first one. You also had oh and I should also say about air displays, I was talking about air displays. So as a display pilot I've been involved with supervision really for over 20 years. I was on the Flying Control Committee of uh, the Royal International Air Tattoo for 20 years. I'm still on the Flying Control Committee for Farnborough International. Um, for 20 year, nearly 20 years, I've been chairman of uh, the Imperial War Museum Duxford's Flying Control Committee. I'm flying display director to this day for an, an air display that takes place at Throckmorton in Worcestershire every year, and also Newcastle in Nor Northern Ireland every year. So I am deeply involved in air displays in, in almost every way. You also had two special events in 1986. What were these? I had many special events in 1986, but I think the ones you're talking about were um, the Queen's birthday fly past, her 60th birthday. It's hard to believe she's 90 this year, and that was 30 years ago. Um, but that was very special. I, we were tasked to put nine, a formation of nine Tornado F2s over the palace for her fly past, 1300 on, her, on the Queen's birthday. And 
we, we did that and it was a beautiful day and all went very well. But what people don't know is that actually we had a grand total of only 10 F2s delivered to the RAF when we did that. So we had to make sure we had every aircraft serviceable, which we did. Um, so that was quite an, quite an achievement. Now that same year, I also led with a lesser number of aircraft, um, the a fly pass for the opening of the Commonwealth Games in Edinburgh. Um, did a lot of other fly pass as well. And I'm sure 1986, there were other very sort of uh, great experiences. Like for example, we were tasked to fly from Lincolnshire to Oman. That was 10 and a half hours um, to be there. It half past nine on the, on, the, on the morning in Oman for a big exercise, exercise swift sword it was known as. And um, that was not only to this day, was that the longest uh, F tornado F3 trip that had ever been conducted, but that also in those days, before we even got declared operational, proved our ability to um, deploy. We pro proved we had a, a far reach. Do you have a favorite aircraft? They've all been favored to me. I've loved every aircraft I've flown. Um, I mentioned I love the Tornado. I have to have to be quite honest. If I've got, a, if I have to say which is my favorite aircraft, it has to be the aircraft that I really wanted to fly right from before I even joined the, the Royal Air Force, and that was the Lightning, because it was my first aircraft. It was such a powerful beast. It was such a beautiful beast. Um, it was single seat. It was just, it was just a, an absolute joy. But that said, I won't detract anything from the Phantom, the Tornado. They were both great brilliant aircraft uh, as well all three of those lightning phantom and tornado all of their 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 maximum speeds they all had a mach 2 capability the tornado was the fastest at low level this this aircraft had a capability of 800 knots at low level whereas the lightning for example we were restricted to 650 knots at low level but they were all great aircraft but long way of getting around again to say the lightning's my favorite and finally do you ever get sick of talking about aviation no. Ha <laughs> <laughs>